All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the 29th day of February in the year of our Lord, 2024. Now, that's something that happens only like once every four years, right? The 29th day of February. So I think one time I did, you know, like, like Facebook or something asks you for your birthday. So if you put in like the 29th day of February, what if you put in the 31st day of February? Does it know the difference? As a as a way to get around uh, around all the birthday garbage and you know those things over the years have gotten worse and worse and worse and have simply become mining tools from the NSA. But uh, how much money does Facebook get paid by the federal government? Part of the black budget? Do you think they would tell us? I don't think so. But it comes out. It, this stuff leaks out, doesn't it? Like the, the Twitter papers, or the Twitter files, whatever they call that. <sighs> yeah, sooner or later the truth comes out. But the thought occurred to me uh, yesterday about Roman Catholicism and Mary. Don't ask me why, I don't know why. The thought just came to me, maybe I saw something on YouTube or whatever, a video title. And uh, I have a long experience with Roman Catholicism. I was married in a Roman Catholic church. My wife is a uh, Roman Catholic family. Um, uh, my in-law, my uh, father-in-law and mother-in-law were devout Catholics. Uh, their children, not so much. <laughs> but uh, uh, anyway, and we, we lived in the border area of Texas for... 10 years, Roman Catholicism, the farther south you get, the, you get down to the border, it's Catholic territory. Uh, uh, Latin America, Mexico, although evangelicalism or something that gets categorized as evangelicalism is uh, uh, growing much stronger than it used to be. I don't know, recently, everything recently has been falling apart, so... Uh, in all kinds of ways, everywhere. <clears throat> we are in the last days. The, the, the time where this is, this is a time of testing. It's a time of tribulation. No way around that. Um, and it's apt to get worse. It will get better when Christ returns, and not until. That's when. That, that is our blessed hope, when Christ comes. And his people... We will be glorified together with him. That is the blessed hope. Us being perfected with Christ. So we don't have to deal with ourselves anymore. Because our, our, as a born-again Christian, and this is really about being born again, uh, the struggle is no longer with God. We're, not, we're at peace with God. But we're not at peace with ourself as far as our old man, our, the, our, what we were born into this world with. Uh, the, as children of Adam, and we're not at peace with the world, obviously, and we're not at peace with Satan. Uh, those are our three enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil. That's what we have to contend with, and the worst of those is our flesh. That's the problem. If it wasn't for that, the devil and the world would be nothing. Uh, Jesus lived in a mortal body, too, and he overcame. Overcame the world. Said the, in the world, you have tribulation. This is a, a truism. In the world you will have tribulation, but fear not, I have overcome the world. So we have peace with God through faith in him, through a relationship of faith with him. That's what people don't understand so often. It is, faith in Christ is a relationship a, of trust. It's like marriage. And uh, the so-called sacraments of 
baptism and and communion are if you want to you can use the word sacrament if you want but it doesn't actually bring grace it is it is our things we do that are relational is part of our relationship with God in Christ baptism is like marriage and communion is like marriage <laughs> it's uh, and that, that's actually a very good example of course God's the one that gave it is see when you enter into a marriage it is not a one-time thing you enter well not usually it is except for that judge up in New York City uh, uh, number three up there but you enter into a permanent relationship a covenant relationship Getting married is just as it's like being born again. It's the beginning of a relationship that continues. It's not a, it's not an experience. It is more than is yes, getting married is an experience, but there's more, you know, it's this outward stuff. But it is entering into a relationship that abides through this life. The relationship we enter into with Christ abides forever. But it's an it's a, you enter into an ongoing thing, which uh, so often you know evangelicals talk about oh it, 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 as an emotional experience or something like that. No, it's not. It it may be emotional, but you're entering into a new life, a new identity. Just like when you get married, you have a new identity. You are not just you anymore. You have become something different. You have become a husband or a wife. And part of a unit that's called a family. And becoming a Christian is like that too. Very much so, only in a bigger scale and more important way. So anyway, I was thinking about uh, Roman Catholicism and uh, Mary. Why, why, do, why are Catholics generally disposed to turning to Mary rather than to Christ himself? And I believe I know the answer. It is because, it is because they are still in their sins. They haven't been born again. See, if you're not born again, you are still in your sins. You have to be in Christ. In Christ. And let's go back over to John chapter 3. Again, we, we have to go by what Jesus says and the apostles say, not what tradition says or the church says or uh, whatever regardless of what church it is it's still the same kind of stuff yeah uh, the church is a what we call church is not church it's the church is God's people all his people those who belong to Christ not those that are part of an organization that that's a man-made thing Jesus Christ, his church. Jesus said, I will build my church, my uh, ecclesia. What is it? Why? Because ecclesia is that which is called out to something. We are called out of the world to Christ. His people are. But there's a whole lot of things that call themselves a church that are definitely of the world. They're not called, they're not out of the world at all. <clears throat> so that's, that's uh, one of the things, if you're born again, you don't belong to the world, you belong to Christ. Your identity changes. Your nationality, in a sense, changes. You're not, uh, you're not an American at heart anymore. Your, your actual identity is with Christ in the kingdom of God. You just happen to live here. And we should have that attitude, too. We are strangers and aliens in this world. <laughs> of course, there's a lot of strangers and aliens in America that aren't necessarily Christians. <clears throat> and getting to be a lot more every day. Okay, I don't want to, I'm trying to keep on subject here. So Jesus says in John chapter 3 to Nicodemus in verse 3, he says, except a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God or born from above. So there, there's something that has to happen to you before you can even perceive God's kingdom. See, so when we when you look at, say, the Roman Catholic Church claims itself to be the one, one true church. The orthodoxy claims the exact same thing. So you have 
two one true churches. One one of them has one head, and the other one has a whole uh, group of heads. One's like, uh, uh, I, well, one's a tyranny, and the other's a family. But nevertheless, it's if if you can see it, it's not his church now, because the Church of Jesus Christ is invisible. It's always invisible because Christ is not visible yet. When he becomes visible. We become visible, too. So here, in John chapter 3, Jesus says, unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. And then, of course, down farther, he says, unless you're born of the Spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. So this is something God has to do in us. The new birth is not an emotional experience, although it can be associated with emotions. It can have no emotions. It is what God does in you. He has to give you a new heart and a new spirit. He has to forgive all your sins. He has to, to uh, uh, give you and put his spirit in you. And you come to know him. You know God. You behold the kingdom of God. I mean, it's you're aware of it. You're aware that you belong to Christ. Christ is your king. Christ is your Lord. Christ is your Savior. Christ is your God. You're aware that you belong to God. Uh, that that you are you, you are at peace with him. <clears throat> you know that Jesus died for all your sins. They're all paid for. All of them. Past, present, and future. All paid for. And you don't have to do anything about that except believe it. See, salvation is all through trusting in God. The word faith is should often be translated as trust. Because that's the way it's used in the New Testament. Trusting in God. It's not simply believing he exists. That's nothing. Everybody knows God exists, whether they want to acknowledge it or not. But that says no, it, it's about a relationship with him, a relationship of trust like marriage. There's lots of women out there, but I'm only married to one. And I only have a relationship with one, that kind of a relationship. And God created marriage as a analogy to salvation. See, the scripture says that for this reason shall a man leave his father and mother. Leave his father and mother. That's important. And cleave to his wife. Be joined to his wife. And the two shall become one flesh. The scripture says in the New Testament that we are made one spirit with Christ. We are partakers of the divine nature. If you're born again. If you're not born again, you're not. You're still fully of Adam. You have what you're born into this world with. But you must be born again of the kingdom of God. You must be born again from above. You must be born of God. Begotten by God. As a new creation. And if you're born again, you have that in you. You're still in your old body until Christ returns. Well, until you die. Then you're without a body until Christ returns. Yeah, see, even the saints in heaven aren't perfected as far as entering into the fullness of what they're supposed to be, what we're supposed to be. They await the resurrection, too, just as we do, the resurrection slash rapture. If you happen to be here, what well, happens? And a large percentage of the people that, that are, uh, when Christ returns, will have been raptured. A lot of uh, percentage of the of the number of believers throughout history. Simply the way population and mathematics work. Uh, side issue, but half the population that's currently alive today is approximately um, equal to all the people that lived before us. I did learn one thing in calculus at least. And how to figure that out. So the total population throughout human history, if you added all, it'd be approximately 16 billion. That's a lot of people. Now, obviously, we can't all be here at once yet, at least. Although under ideal conditions, the Earth could support a lot much larger population but it's not ideal because it's, we've got 8 billion sinners on the planet right now. That's doing a lot of damage. 
sinful people do sinful things to God's creation. God God can heal it, but like near here, as I've said before, there's a uh, Kickapoo uh, um, recreational area in State Park is is close to me here, very close, and it was all strip mines, and it's beautiful, but. If you look at a Google Earth, look above, it's like somebody just took some claws and just ripped the earth. It was never reclaimed. And so they, there's, uh, they moved the river and all kinds of things to get the coal. All steam shovels and stuff like that. <clears throat> and they pretty much just left it when the, you know, they, they didn't bother to reclaim anything back in those days. But now it's beautiful. It's one of the most beautiful, beautiful places in Illinois. Uh, beautiful river, beautiful ponds all over the place. And it's amazing. Just filled with deer and other animals. This, the, the state of, El of Illinois denies it, but, but I, uh, I'm very sure that I saw a mountain lion, a cougar, over there one time. A large one. The size of my German shepherd. And so all, I told it to the, to the park rangers, oh, we don't have any of those here. Yeah. So, oh, it's about this big bobcat. Well, I don't think a bobcat has a tail. Like, <laughs> I'm not absolutely sure I was fumbling for a camera when I saw it, but, man, that was, it was walking down the road. It wasn't, oh, 50 yards in front of me. Man. Like, that didn't look like a bobcat to me. Now, I've never seen a picture of a bobcat that looked like that. Yeah, that, that was a mountain lion. <laughs> Cougar. Pretty sure. Yeah. Oh, but they're not supposed to be the, any of those here. Side issue. I heard a report from a person, an employee at, at Tractor Supply. How reliable this is, I don't know. That has to that happens to live on the edge of that and says, yeah, they're they're there. And uh, he said that the state actually imported them into this area because of the deer population. But they refused to acknowledge it for liability reasons. <laughs> so uh, they have campgrounds there. I I don't know if I would want to have little children in a campground in in that area. They're pretty skittish around people, but uh, you have mountain lions near camping. Doesn't sound like a good combination. Which is maybe why they're not acknowledging it. W would the government lie about anything? Of course not. Of course the government would not lie about it. Of course Illinois wouldn't do anything like that, would they? Something dumb and then try to cover it up? Who, why would they do something like that? Oh, my. Oh, my wife heard something in the news here last night. Uh, if, you've, if you've heard of the in vitro, vitro um, uh, law, I think it's Alabama, where they passed a law that that uh, the, the fertilized embryos are children legally. And I heard, oh, well, that's going to cause a lot of problems. And sure enough, it has. Um, because apparently there was an accident. And a customer got into the closet or wherever, or the refrigerator, well, I don't know, where there was uh, like a, the, a culture, a Petri dish with fertilized embryos. And uh, knocked it over or something, and they were they f ended up on the floor, and they were lost. They died, and they were so the people that they sued the the clinic, and the the Supreme Court of Alabama ruled that those embryos were children. Oh man, does that open up a a, a can of worms? So now you have involuntary manslaughter, negligent manslaughter possibilities and everything else because of a, a lab accident that wasn't even done. So so in other words, if it, a lab technician drops, makes a mistake, drops something or whatever, 
Uh, it could be manslaughter. <laughs> That is a, in other words, so all the most of the clinics I heard shut down temporarily until this, they get this sorted out because there's no way they want this liability. Of course, of course. Uh, so what you can do things that you think are good, but there can be unintended consequences. I don't think there's any reason for in, for in vitro fertilization. We got around along without it for 6,000 years. We don't need it. Uh, there's... Go adopt a child. There's plenty of children. There's unwed mother just pumping them out around here. Of course, they usually keep them nowadays. And then grandma has to raise them. Uh, you've got all kinds of mothers out there that shouldn't be allowed to have a child. Shouldn't be allowed to keep a child because they are just evil and negligent and give their children cocaine and everything else. How many of them, you know, it's bad. This is a bad world. Okay, back to the subject here. So uh, Roman Catholicism, why do Catholics tend to prefer to go to Mary? I'm not saying it's universal, but Mary's really uh, almost central to Roman Catholicism. Uh, John Paul II, his his motto was "Totus Tuum," I believe. Uh, no, uh, all I'm all yours, Mary, is what it was. "Totus Tuum Maria" or something like that. Uh, um, but it was it was he dedicated his life to Mary, not to Christ. Uh, many of the uh, sources of ideas today come from visions of Mary. Uh, various apparitions uh, down in the Rio Grande Valley. We often would have every month, it seemed, a news report on the television about a new apparition of Mary, sometimes Jesus, but it was usually somebody saw Mary in the scorch marks on a tortilla or on the stain on a window. And, uh, and all of a sudden, there's people in front of the house lighting candles and kneeling in prayer. And then you had the Basilica de San Juan. Or, uh, technically, the name is the, the Basilica uh, de la Virgen de San Juan, the Virgin of San Juan, the, the Basilica of the Virgin of San Juan in San Juan, Texas. And they have a, an idol, uh, an image that is like a, one of those large dolls that are really made for adults, decorative things. And they went down to Mexico to get it. And the story is there was a miracle on the way back. Catholics and miracles. There, there's a, a candle room. You go in this, and if you go back to where the image is, it's up, on, up above. Behind the altar, there's like a partition. But you can go through this room, and they have a room of miracles, uh, glass cases filled with crutches and uh, different things that supposedly happened in response to prayer to this Virgin of San Juan, Mary. And also, there's a whole room where it's all glass with ventilators, power vents, filled with candles burning to Mary. I mean, thousands, there has to be a thousand candles or more there in that thing. And they, again, if they need like a, a, a vent system that you'd have in a restaurant over the kitchen because of all the heat coming off these candles. Uh, and it's just the, the little votive candles. Just a whole good-sized room full of them. And then you go behind that, and that's where the entrance is to the, the adoration, I'm going to use the Catholic word here, adoration area. I would say worship because that's what they're doing. And you have, there's always people in there kneeling down in, in adoration and petition prayer to Mary, to this, this large doll. And then, of course, there's a, like a sun around the doll, if I remember correctly. So they're, they're down there and they're looking up to Mary, not to Christ. There is an image of Christ, if I believe, he's off to the side. 
That's typical down in the valley. Christ is to the side, and there's a couple candles burning there, too, but not much. If I recall correctly. But, yeah, that was, and this is a, a new, a large, this is a basilica. It's a major thing. <clears throat> I was there numerous times. And I even uh, listened to a couple services. I actually heard a pretty good preaching of the gospel one time. I don't know how that happened. Oh, I know. It was part of the text for the day, I think. And it's part of the uh, the the, uh, uh, the liturgy. Uh, had to do with uh, the Old Testament. Uh, I think it was Jeremiah 31, maybe. Anyway, uh, why do Catholics prefer Mary? And I think I know the answer. Because they're still in their sin. And Christ is a threat. So when you're not born again, you don't have peace with God. Uh, you, you have peace with the world. You have peace with your flesh. And you have peace with the devil, but you don't have peace with God. God is your adversary. He's, see, Christ is coming as judge. And that's the way a lot of Catholics see it. See, either Christ is dead on the cross, or he's coming as judge. That's how he's presented. When you see images of Christ, it's almost always on a crucifix. Or in the Vatican, you see the famous statue, uh, that artwork, where, where uh, the body of Christ is in the arms of his mother Mary, which is totally bogus. That never happened. No, uh, no, that, if you read the scripture, that, that, never, that never happened at all. But that's, that's the way it's pictured. It, it, it's a dead Christ. Christ is pictured as dead. And, of course, the Mass is uh, uh, the repre uh, repre representation. I, want to, I don't want to distort Catholic, Catholic theology. They've cleaned it up a bit, because they had to. But the repre because they're not crucifying him over again, but it is still a sacrifice and a true sacrifice. Problem with they've got so much tradition they have to reconcile it all together and it, it's impossible. So, but the, the idea that the mass is a true sacrifice, it's a representation of Christ's death in a different manner, on bloody manner. So, essentially, Christ is being uh, uh, not a new, but his his death is being presented again to the Father as a true sacrifice. Every time the mass is done, that's that's the theology. And apparently it only works for what the sins that happened in the past. So they have to do it over and over and over and over. So like, like when Daniel talks about the, uh, the book of Daniel talks about the continuing sacrifice or the daily sacrifice. Actually, it's the, the word there is the continuing. Uh, being terminated. This happened historically, by the way, in uh, the book of uh, in the Old Testament during the period of the Maccabees. But the temple being uh, profaned by Antiochus Epiphanes, but the uh, uh, the mass is today the continuing sacrifice to God in Catholic theology, and it'd be in Orthodox theology too. Although they have less theology, but it's there. It is this sacramentalism. This this uh, you have to represent all the time, and it's just like in. Lutheranism, I, I fear that Lutheranism is what I experienced, what, what I absorbed as a Lutheran growing up, was it is, uh, it's just forgiveness is easier. <laughs> it's, there's no priest necessary. Um, so rather than having to go to a priest for the confession, you, you sin and then you ask God to forgive you. So you grow up taught as a child, now I lay my... Uh, you know, a little prayer we're taught to say before we go to bed. You know, God, for, talk, ask God to forgive your sins, and and then, okay, we believe God forgives our sins, and then the next day you wake up and sin some more and and repeat, repeat and rinse, repeat and rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat, and that's what Catholics do. That's what Lutherans do. Uh, I suspect there's a lot of people, uh, and Orthodox. Um, Methodists, probably. I mean, most evangelicals in most 
uh, people that are called termed evangelicals, and most uh, uh, Protestants and Orthodox and Catholics do the same thing. It is not a once-for-all sacrifice and a once-for-all forgiveness, entering into God's eternal life, entering into forgiveness by being in Christ. See, the, the, the death of Christ only truly atones for those who are in Christ. If you're not in him, as the scripture says, if you refuse to believe in Christ, if you refuse to, to come to him, you are still in your sin and the wrath of God abides on you. It's what Jesus said in John. Or, or John said, John at least, not quite sure who actually spoke these words. John chapter 3, verse 36. He that believes in the Son, actually it's in, the literally it's into the Son, has everlasting life, but he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but hath, the wrath of God abideth on him. Uh, let's go down and look at the actual Greek here. There's no textual variance here, really. The one, the believing one, this this is the particular common form that John uses all the time. It is It, it has to do with something that's, uh, uh, the way that this is written, believing is something that is characteristic to this person. These people are identified as believers. This is a characteristic of them. Just like color would be, or, or another, uh, it would characterize a group of people. So it is one who is a believer, who is, it's an ongoing thing. It is not simply one who temporarily believes. No, this is a characteristic of these people. The believing one, the one believing into the Son, literally, into the Son, has, present tense, life eternal. Life unto the ages of the ages. But the one um, I'm going to say refusing to believe, re not believing, who the one who is, in other words, you've heard but you reject. This is not ignorance, this is unbelief. So you hear the message and you don't you don't receive it. You don't receive Christ. But the one unbelieving, the Son, the one not believing, the one disbelieving the Son, shall not see life, but the wrath or anger of God abides on him upon him. That's what the scripture says. That's what Jesus or the John the Apostle said. Again, the, the, the red letters, not necessarily, that's been added. But that's what it says there. So the believing into the Son, literally, the, the one who is believing, uh, has become a believer into the Son. Who's, so you're in the Son. That one has eternal life, present life. And this is so. This is like an ongoing thing. It's it's not. It's a life. Like it's like being married. It's not a come and go thing. Well, it's not supposed to be. You're in a relationship. This is about relationship with God in Christ. Being in the Son is like being in marriage. Married to the Son. Trusting the word here is uh, the one trusting in Christ. Is not believing abstractly in his existence. No. Everybody knows that God exists. So, but if you're not born again, you're not in him, you don't have that peace of God uh, that you have when you're born again. You're, you're, uh, you're still in your sins. You're still, their sin still separates you from God. You may believe that God exists. You may believe that Jesus is the Messiah. 
you may be believe he came and died for the sins of the world, and you may be a member of the church, you may do this, you may do that. But if you're not born again, you're not really at peace with God because you're not in Christ. You don't have that kind of a relationship where Christ is in you, which Paul says that's the mark of being a Christian. If anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is none of his, does not belong to Christ. So God, Christ, God in Christ must be in you, and you must be born again. You must be born of the Spirit. You must be made one spirit with God. You must have that new heart, that work that God does in you. Now you know him. He's your father, and you're his child, literally. Not just as a metaphor. You've been begotten by God, the Scripture says. Partakers of a divine essence, his fusus, his nature. That's what happens when you're born again. You may not understand it at the time, but you know something happened because before you wanted to believe, let's put it this way, you wanted to believe, you wanted to trust in God perhaps, but now you do. And it's not, well, I sort of trusted yesterday for a while. Uh-uh. Mm -mm. That's not how it works. You have faith. You abide in him. And he abides in you. Because there's, there's a new creation in you, as Paul says. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things become new. Your identity has moved from Adam to Christ. That's a real thing. But if that hasn't happened, if you're still in Adam and not in Christ, then God is still your judge. And Christ is the coming king, the one coming in judgment. You may believe he exists. You may believe what he did. But you're not trusting in what he did. You're not trusting in him. So you want to trust... you. So you look to something else because, well, as Jesus said, light is coming in the world and men hated the light because their deeds are evil. So people that are still sinners, that still practice sin, that still love sin, their identity is still there. They're still in Adam. They're still in their old man. They, because they don't have a new man, they avoid Christ, just like in the Garden of Eden. What happened? They, their eyes were opened and they saw they were naked. They felt naked. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover their nakedness. Then they heard God walking in the garden. And they did what? They went and hid. And the children of Adam have been doing that ever since. We hide from God. God's out there. He's a threat because he's the judge. He's the king who's coming in judgment. We don't want to appear before the judgment seat of Christ. We're afraid because of our son. When you understand that Christ has died for you, truly believe that he has died for your sins. His sin, your sins are atoned for. That consciousness of sin is removed. As the writer of, of, of Hebrews teaches. See, if, you, if that consciousness of sin remains, as it did with me as a child, well, it's a, up until I was 21 years old, basically. See, it's the it's rinse and repeat cycle, whether you're Catholic or Orthodox or Lutheran or Reformed or whatever. You have this rinse and repeat thing. You sin, you go to God for forgiveness. You sin, go for our Church of Christ, too. Sin, go to God for forgiveness. Yes, yeah, sin, go to God, God for forgiveness. You don't have this consciousness that Christ died for my sin. And it's paid for. Always paid for. It's not dependent on me confessing all my sins. No, it's, I constantly look to Christ. He is my salvation. I know that. He is the one I have. His, his, what he did on the cross is what I trust in. Not what I do, but what he did. But for Catholics and 
at least most, most Catholics, most Lutherans, most Protestants, most, most evangelicals, certainly for uh, Church of the Christ and others like that. That's what you have. It's what you do. My asking, God is able to forgive, and I go to him, and I ask forgiveness, and then I go and sin. Then I ask forgiveness and go and sin. And if I sin, I'm lost until I ask forgiveness again. Because you don't have an abiding relationship. It's not like marriage. It's an adversarial relationship. And so you don't want to go to Christ. So you go to Mary. Because she's easy. She's not God. She's not the judge. You're more comfortable going to her or saints, ones that you do not have to answer to. And I think that's the real reason that Mary is so important among Catholics. I don't have enough knowledge of the reform of the Orthodox to say too much about that, but I, she has a pretty strong role there too. Because sinners are more comfortable with Mary than they are with the Lord Jesus Christ. They don't know him. It's evidence of not being born again. Otherwise, why would not you? If you know God, if you have an abiding relationship to him, if you're, if you're uh, betrothed to the Lord Jesus, why would you not go directly to him? If, if you're living in a relationship with him, that's like marriage. Why do you not go directly to him? Your sins are against him. Why would you go to his mother, who is just a saint like everybody else that belongs to Christ? Now, she had a particular role, but it wasn't salvific. Mary can't save you. She can't forgive your sins. Only Christ can do that. If you trust in him, your sins are already paid for and forgiven. And I fear that the many evangelicals and fundamentalists are in the same boat. Not that they go to Mary, but they go to something else because they're uncomfortable with Christ. They, theologically minded, uh, Lutherans, the theologically minded ones I'm talking about in particular. You'll find them on the internet. And theologically minded like Calvinists. They love theology. But they talk very little about relationship to Christ. Theology just fig leaves. It allows them to look at something without looking at Christ and convince themselves they're good because they hold the right theology. Perhaps they hold the right theology. But theology is not a relationship of trust in Christ. It is not Christ in you. Christ is not about theology. It's about his person and a, a real covenant personal relationship. That's best analogy is marriage. Are you married to him? If you're not, you're not really saved. I mean, you may not fully understand that in those terms. But if you don't have a relationship, an abiding relationship of trust in Christ and trust in what he did, not just as a, as a system of theology, but as an actual relational life, you're not saved. You must be born again. You must be born of the Spirit. It's a work of God in you. If you don't have that, you could go to God and ask him, why don't I have that? Go look up Ezekiel 36, starting at verse 26 or so. Read about the promises of God. This is Jeremiah 31, starting at verse 31, what God promises to do in the new covenant. 
That's what Jesus came to establish, the new covenant. Are you in the new covenant? Water baptism doesn't do it. Paul says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Have you called upon Christ to, to save you? Knowing what salvation is. Or at least part of what salvation is. You don't have to have a lot of knowledge. You just have to do it. You have to desire it. Those who hunger and thirst after righteousness will be satisfied. Jesus said, all those who seek find. All those who ask, it's given to them. All those who knock, it's open unto them. If you don't want it, if you are content to live as a child of Adam, God's not going to bother you. He wants you to be saved, but if you don't desire it, he's not going to force it on you. You cannot be saved through any other means but through faith, trusting faith in Christ. If you don't want Jesus Christ, you know, there's a lot of fundamentalists. They believe, well, I said a prayer. I did this. I did that. I went forward. You're trusting in what you did. Are you trusting in what Christ did for you? When I hear people say that, I think, so? Lots of people do things. Does that, does, that doesn't make you saved. It's not what you did or what Christ did. Do you belong to Christ? That's what's important. Is he in you? That's what's important. Not what you did. See, your focus should be on what he did. Are you trusting in what he did? Or are you trusting in what you did? One is life, the other is death. 